When children are abused, either emotionally, physically, or sexually, they may no longer feel that their world is a safe place. While all abused children are affected by the experience, some are able to cope and move on with their lives. Others, however, are not. Play therapy provides an opportunity for these children to work through their problems. Many children who are abused are unable to verbalize their feelings. Others are unwilling to because they believe people are not to be trusted. Play therapy offers children an opportunity to express painful emotions, resolve their difficulties, and resume the normal process of development. I think that the most important goal in working with children who have been abused or traumatized is to restore a level of functioning as soon as possible. Dr. Eliana Gill is a family therapist as well as a registered play therapist. You can draw a picture basically of anything you like, anything you want, um, using as many colors or as few colors as you want. And there's Events have occurred that have taken the child by surprise, uh, used up some of the energies they would usually have available for other tasks that have to do with development. Um, they have a certain amount of anxiety or fear or confusion or distress or pain that they've had to deal with. And our goal is basically to provide a corrective, reparative experience, uh, make sure that whatever questions the child has have been answered in some way, and make sure that feelings that are associated with the events have been expressed, and again, not necessarily verbally, but in some way, um, and that the child has had an opportunity to look at this event and put it behind them as opposed to continuing to be engaged with it. But the most important thing is restore the level of functioning. Uh, hopefully get the child back to where they were before this event happened and uh, caused some kind of interruption in their developmental process. In this videotape, I'll describe how play therapy can address the specific needs of children who've been abused. First, I'll explain the impact that abuse has on children. Then I'll show you how to establish rapport with these children by creating an environment that's conducive to the healing process. I'll also demonstrate several play therapy methods that address some of the problems commonly experienced by abused children. Hello there. How are you, miss? The children you see me working with are not actual patients. They have volunteered to help in the production of this videotape with the permission of their parents. Although they are not patients, my work with them will illustrate many of the play therapy techniques I typically employ with abused children. You will notice that the play therapy techniques may be the same, but abused children have unique responses, and I'll comment on those differences from time to time. Feelings of belonging, feelings of significance, feelings of virtue, and the attainment of love are critical to a child's development of identity. And it is these very feelings that are compromised in a child who has been abused. Abuse affects children in a variety of ways, creating a wide spectrum of symptoms, from apparently mild to obviously severe. These include fear and anxiety, depression, anger, hostility, or aggression, precocious or aggressive sexual behavior, low self-esteem, and difficulty maintaining relationships. Untreated, the effects of abuse will continue to impact a child throughout his or her life. It does appear that it has uh, an impact on the development of self in terms of how people view themselves, whether they feel good about themselves or feel that they have something to offer or they're lovable or worthwhile. And of course, that uh, feeling of not being a worthwhile human being affects their choices and the decisions they make about things they pursue or don't pursue. So the self seems to be very affected by the experience of childhood abuse. Going along with that, you have problems with trusting people, 
problems about being dependent on others. Obviously, there's lots of relationship problems that can come up. Um, within the concept of relationships, there can be problems with sexual dysfunctions, there can be problems with violence, and the repetition sometimes of the dynamics of abuse that they encountered in childhood. So it would not be unusual, for example, for someone with a history of physical abuse to end up in an adult relationship where violence is part of that. I think that one of the most insidious lessons of physical abuse is that people who love you will hurt you. There are lots of other areas where people have difficulty, sometimes uh, self-destructive behaviors. If they begin to view themselves as people who deserve to be abused, sometimes they punish themselves. Um, you have behaviors such as uh, substance abuse. There's a part that's a punishment and a part that I think involves numbing so that they don't feel anything and things aren't as difficult and uh, their emotions are easier to deal with for them. Uh, those kinds of situations can come up as well. In my experience, no two abused children behave the same way. Some externalize their difficulties and those around them can sense there is a problem. Others internalize their pain and apparently develop adaptive behaviors such as excelling in school or at sports. Still others seem more stress resistant or resilient and apparently fare better. Despite having a list of symptoms as a guideline for making an assessment of abuse, you should avoid relying on them exclusively as a diagnostic tool to conclude or confirm abuse. The same list of symptoms may indicate distress, for example, due to parental divorce or death, family alcoholism, neurological problems, family violence, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. like to touch the sand. It feels good on your hands. And underneath you When a child first comes to therapy, there are some things that are important to keep in mind. First of all, the child may not know why he or she is coming to therapy, may not know there is a problem, may already be distrustful of adults, and at a minimum probably feels anxious. Let's see if I can if I make a letter, you know what it is. Absolutely. Because the child does not know what to expect, one of the first things to do is to create a therapeutic rapport. I think building rapport with children is an interesting process. It's challenging. You have to be so open initially to the human being you're going to see and just allow them enough space, enough distance, enough safety and respect um, that they can begin feeling more and more comfortable and more likely to show themselves to you. Not only the parts of themselves maybe that they're comfortable with, but the parts of themselves that they're not. How everything's organized for you? you like I try to develop rapport by first giving the child a tour of the play therapy room so the child can see all the available options and choices. I also limit the number of questions I ask initially and I try to empathize with any discomfort he or she may be having. I'll also let a child's parents stay with us until the child feels more at ease. In our initial meeting, I set the context for the therapy, explaining that I'm someone who works with children by talking some and playing some, and I tell the child that he or she can say as much or as little as they want. I say that we will use some of the toys in the room and that I'm available to listen or answer any questions. The object is to provide an atmosphere in which the child feels little pressure, some control, and eventually feelings of safety and trust. Keep in mind, however, that not all children will respond to a safe atmosphere with immediate trust. Some kids who've been abused find that concept a little uncomfortable. One child I'm working with uh, right now has been uh, very, very reluctant to talk about certain things. And she said to me from the first meeting, I'm not going to tell you about that. 
And I said something to her like, well, that's fine. I think it's a really good idea to only say things when you want to and not to have to feel like somebody's making you do it because I can't make you do anything. Well, it's been now about six months, and the other day she said to me, um, so if I want to talk about serious things in here, I can, can't I? And I said, well, only if you would want to. No, but if I wanted to, I could. She said, yeah, I mean, if you wanted to, I'm certainly available to listen to you. But it's taken that long to get from point A to point B. In the treatment of abused children, there are two different approaches that play therapists use, directive and non-directive. Typically, the theoretical model that the therapist utilizes guides the level of the therapist's activity. For example, psychoanalytic play therapists are non-directive by nature. The non-directive approach comes from the psychoanalytic theory um, that basically holds to the fact that the child will bring forward whatever unconscious material um, that child needs to bring forward and you leave it alone and you let it take as long as it takes. And the directive approach is much more that you need to guide children to certain material. So you got the better of the dinosaur, huh? Yep. Therapists who work from different theoretical models, including behavioral, humanistic, and developmental, use the play to direct children to the pertinent issues. It seems like you have friends, yes, and then you lose friends. Yep. What's it like for you when you lose your friends? How do these approaches differ from each other? I tend to look at it in this way. A non-directive approach provides the child with ample opportunity to direct his or her own therapy and encourages insight and personality development through verbal interpretation of play and behavior. The directive therapist takes primary responsibility for guiding the therapy process and challenges the child to address specific concerns or change specific thoughts or behaviors. In my opinion, the non-directive therapies are most critical and effective at the beginning of treatment and in some cases, they may be the treatment of choice throughout the full course of therapy. The non-directive approach demands very little of the child. It also says to the child, you're in control here. You get to select what you want to play with. This is a time that's just for you. This is designed just for you and your needs and whatever it is that you think might be helpful to you. I have found that working with abused children requires me to be eclectic since children fluctuate between wanting to master and at the same time wanting to avoid painful situations. Children have basically two drives. One drive is to master difficult situations and I think developmentally we see that all the time. Child has a problem, the child is challenged and often finds great pleasure in trying to solve that problem and uh, that has to do with mastery and it has to do with control. But along the same lines, I think kids have another drive and that is to suppress material that's difficult, that's painful, or that's uncomfortable to them. Although many play therapists follow a strict theoretical model, others follow an integrated approach in recognition of the fact that children may react more or less favorably to one or another. I let the child determine what approach I will use. I notice that in play when children have been abused that they deal with these things so differently. So one child will come in and basically lay the whole thing out in front of you and obviously in front of themselves and say this is what happened to me and this is what I think about it or this is how I feel about it. Um, and they'll do that symbolically sometimes or they'll do that in their artwork or they'll do that in a variety of ways but they're doing it. And other children will come in and they're adamant that this is not anything I'm ever going to speak about. Um, and their play doesn't even symbolically bring any of those issues that one might expect would be included in an experience like that. So kids can go either direction. So I think what that means to me is that I have to wait and see what kind of a child I'm working with in order to determine how to best be helpful to that child.
when kids come to see me, what we do is the kids get to decide what they want to play with and what they want to do. And it's in working with abused children, I've found that the standard therapeutic toys are very effective. However, I have added a few toys that seem particularly helpful. These include, but are not limited to, the following toys and activities. Telephones, sunglasses, feeling cards, puppets, sand and miniatures, art materials, nursing bottles, dishes, and utensils, medical kits, shields, capes, plastic swords, and a courtroom replica. When we're working with children, we have to assume that the most useful medium for them is going to be play. So we want to have toys that are carefully chosen, purposefully chosen, so that they can use them as symbols to communicate to us whatever concerns are going on. So for example, one of the first things that I try to teach people when we're talking about play therapy is you can't just put generic toys in there because then what you're setting up is some kind of a playroom where kids will come in and do generic play. When you're doing play therapy, you have to carefully select out things that have the potential to be used symbolically for communication of difficult things. Um, particularly it's true when we're working with abused, traumatized children that we need to have materials available to them that relate to the experience and the dynamics of the experience. Children express their inner thoughts and feelings in many different ways. However, drawing and painting are especially useful in the treatment of children who have suffered abuse. Chris is not an abused child, but his work serves as an example of a child who has a sense of mastery over his life and has a good self-concept. These are some of the factors artwork can illustrate. It also helps us see how they organize their own world. Um, so if you say to a child, uh, draw a picture, for example, of your family. When they do that, it helps us see how they see things. When you ask children to, to draw something about their family or something about uh, a family activity, the content uh, that comes up usually tends to be something that's fairly important to the family. A lot of the children that we work with who are abused, the issues of self-esteem and the issues of um, even just bringing up, for example, family activity may to them suggest something painful or may suggest something that they're longing for. So right away you'll see a different affect connected to the experience of drawing this difficult material. The drawings and paintings created by abused children can yield a tremendous amount of information to the therapist. However, interpreting the meaning of their work is not a simple task. Barbara Sobel and Carol Thayer Cox are registered art therapists and professors at George Washington University Art Therapy Department. Well, I think that um, art offers children something they're very familiar with and they're very comfortable with. Most kids really like to pick up a paintbrush or crayons and draw, and it's a natural environment for them to be doing art. Also, I think with abused children, um, they're more afraid of talking and exposing what really went on, and sometimes it's really just simpler and more natural for them to express what happened um, without having to articulate it, um, and in some ways get themselves in trouble by articulating it. So often children who've been abused have been told not to tell by the abuser and have been threatened if they do tell that something terrible would happen to them. So they often don't, and they keep it a secret for years and years. And so the opportunity to do something nonverbally is helpful for them to be able to communicate what happened. When assessing the artwork of children who have been abused, our subjective responses may be informative as well as the themes that children suggest through their images, colors, or verbal descriptions. There are certain themes that, that show up with, with children. There are themes about the abuse when they actually are depicting a scenario of abuse, and but that's a theme to, to look for, the specific theme of looking at the abuser and the victim and what's occurred or, or where the abuse occurred. That, that shows up a lot with the environment in which it occurred. Some of the things you might see um, is an expression of, um, particularly with sexual abuse, you might see the sexuality or an over-focus on sexuality or explicit focus on sexuality appear in pictures. 
and its opposite, which would be the absolute avoidance of mentioning or depicting a topic that's uh, frightening. So that if, again, if it's sexuality, it would be avoidance of sexual parts or that parts of the body that would connote sexuality. Artwork can also be an indicator of the child's sense of self, that is, how they view and feel about themselves. So you might see the sense of being damaged. Uh, you can see that, in, again, it can show up in the depiction of a tree or a house. Um, I've had children draw houses with cracks going down them, or uh, a tree that is scarred, um, or with broken branches. Uh, just a sense of, of not being whole. Um, and as well, you could see a sense of fear, a sense of being really scared. Um, and children can do that, so, depict that so poignantly in the, in the work, in the artwork. Sand play therapy proposes that the sand tray is symbolic of the child's psyche, an externalization of their internal world. As the child creates this world, the therapist observes and engages the child in order to more fully understand the symbolic meaning. So, the idea is you can take whatever you want from over there and then just build a little world inside here. Okay? And you can also, I told you before... Again, Anthony is not an abused child, but his work in the sand tray nicely demonstrates how a child's inner world can be expressed externally. The play is therapeutic in and of itself and provides the child with ample opportunities for reparative experiences. My job is to be a quiet but active observer. I pay attention to what he chooses or avoids, what he puts back or keeps in the tray, how he organizes the miniatures, what he pays more or less attention to, if his affect changes during the building of the world. In addition, I watch to see how he interacts with the materials. That is, is he careful and hesitant, looking up for approval, or is he carefree and comfortable? Children often produce intricate scenarios abundant with symbolism. As with drawings or paintings, I watch for repetitive themes or patterns of interaction over time before developing clinical hypotheses. You don't conclude anything on the basis of one drawing or one sand tray, but you take some notes, some mental notes, and then you watch for the next one and the next one and the next one, and then you see, do themes appear? Are there always catastrophes? Is the ch are the children always in danger? Is someone available to help the children? Do they get rescued? Or are they always left in this perilous condition and there's no one to help them with? Are they nurtured? Are they safe? You know, there's so many themes that come out in these materials. Now, what are you building there? Um, a dungeon. Oh, it's a dungeon. And what happens in the dungeon? It's where um, the bad people go. Mm -hmm. They don't obey the law. Oh, I see. So break the rules means you go to the dungeon, huh? What kind of rules do you think they might break, Anthony? Stealing money. Stealing money. Uh-huh. In my experience, the most striking difference in the sand play of abused children compared to non-abused children is thematic. In contrast to Anthony's tray, abused children may create violent, disorganized, barren, dangerous, or frightening environments, a less nurturing and safe world where danger persists and rescuers are few and far between. Now tell me a little bit about what this is. This is um, the king and queen's friend. Mm -hmm. um, it's like the person who uh, calls Godzilla to come rescue them. Mm -hmm. So this is a friend of the king and the queen. And this friend calls Godzilla to be the, you called him the guardian, right? He's going to take care of people here. Right. George Bible's going to destroy the look at the tower, and this is going to destroy the castle. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of danger, but there's also a lot of protectors, a lot of people looking out for things that might happen, huh? It's important to not jump to any conclusions about things here because um, 
as I say, typically kids may create a world like this. What you would want to see is over time, uh, whether there's a continuation of themes that are um, problematic to you. The fact that he creates a conflict is not a problem. The fact that he's able to resolve the conflict pretty well is a good indicator that this kid is doing just fine. If you have children where it's a danger valley, but the danger is always present, and the danger cannot be overcome, and there's no way to protect, and there's no nurturing, then you begin to see some other themes that, of course, you can get worried about. So is this a good place, then, to take the picture? It's in many ways a very typical uh, tray for a child of his gender and his age, and a child who's fairly healthy and comes from a very uh, nurturing environment. How you doing, man? Give me five. Puppet play is another play therapy technique that offers several benefits to children. They can create stories, but can do so anonymously, using specific characters to portray hidden conflicts or concerns. Puppets, again, are symbols, and the puppets have mouths that the kids manipulate. And I always encourage people, make sure you have the mouth, because it right away cues the child, you're supposed to talk through this. And kids tell stories that are amazing using the puppets. Oftentimes, if a child put a, puts a puppet on their hand, they're no longer the child. They're now the, this puppet. And they can tell you things as the squirrel who's lost and scared that they can't tell you as the little boy who's behind that little squirrel. So the putting on of these images and the pretend play that gets elicited by puppets is a remarkable way to, again, try to ascertain what really is going on for the child. I'm going to sting you, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you're like going to go back down, okay? Back here? Yeah. Okay. And then you find the dinosaur, okay? Mm -hmm. Then he like eats you up, okay? The idea behind the puppet play is that it allows the child an opportunity to distance from difficult material, to kind of if you want to use the words hide behind, uh, but to identify with perhaps an object or, or a symbol of some kind, then to project his or her own feelings and thoughts and situations onto that particular object, and then create a story. This is a story called Peter and the Dinosaur. A long time ago when my, when my little son um, had a best friend named Peanut. One day, Peanut died. Often the stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and typically stories have a conflict that emerges uh, somewhere during the story. And then you also get to see uh, through the child's creation of a conflict and then addressing the conflict the primary modes by which the child might think about um, taking care of a problem or solving a problem or whatever. The wolf was in its room, minding its own business. Along comes the dinosaur. Then the wolf eats the dinosaur. So the putting on of these images and the pretend play that gets elicited by puppets is a remarkable way to, again, try to ascertain what really is going on for the child. Because you have what the child shows you, and then there's all the underlying things that are important for us to know about. And sometimes the behavior and the underlying issues really belie themselves. You can have a child who's angry and beating up every kid in the class, and you say, gee, what, a, what an angry oppositional child. Underneath might be the loneliest, most scared child that you've ever seen, or a child who feels terribly, um, a terrible amount of longing for someone to care for him and has absolutely no notion how to get that to happen. So sometimes the best um, offense, the best defense is offense. So the child will come across as this really rugged, strong kid, but underneath there's something else completely different going on. Play therapy is usually conducted with an individual child. However, it can also be useful for sibling sessions. Neither of these brothers is an abuse victim, yet their puppet play offers an example of ways to explore alternative approaches to behaviors
that might be the result of abuse. Hey, Mr. Dinosaur. Ralph. Hey, Mr. Wolf, don't go away. Mr. Dinosaur? Yes. Have you ever thought of not eating people? No. No? Is it that you're hungry all the time? Sometimes. Sometimes? Because I'm just wondering, do you think that you and Mr. Wolf could be friends rather than one of you having to eat the other? No. That's a good idea. Huh? That's a good idea. That's a, that's a good idea. Usually when I do that with kids, it's in the vein of, um, well, this is something that you guys can think about. And at least what it's done is created an alternative option for them in terms of uh, how they might think about this particular situation. Okay? Okay. See you guys. Bye. And then over here, Gio, we have the dollhouse and lots of different kinds of families. Another valuable technique in play therapy that gives children a way to voice their experiences is the dollhouse. If we are talking with children, obviously they live in family environments. And so, for example, the use of the dollhouse is, is very important because kids can create their um, information or communicate information about the environments in which they live. So I always talk to kids about, well, let's say it's morning time in the house. So what happens now? And how do people wake up? And how do they know it's time to wake up? So sometimes I cue kids to give me information. Other times they just go in there and they just recreate things right away. Then I'm going to go quick to the living room and just go back to the kids. Mm -hmm. And he goes up to work. He uses a taxi. Mm -hmm. Then you don't see me. Okay. So he's gone now. He's driving his taxi. I think that what you see with uh, Giovanna is a willingness to uh, engage with me as the person who's available to her at the moment to uh, engage with the play very freely and to report what she's doing, in other words, to verbalize what she's doing as she's doing it. The mom's and dad's room to, to, to jump on the bed. <laughs> they like jumping on the bed. That's a fun thing to do. Then they go, then they go to the room to see what time it is to go to school. Oh. But the brother and the sister has to take something. The themes that she presented seem to be pretty conflict-free, but something you might expect with a, a child maybe who's been injured is uh, less of a, an ability to trust, less willingness to verbalize what they're doing, uh, perhaps more of a flat affect, uh, an inability to engage as freely in the play or to be as spontaneous or to be having as much fun. Yeah, this closes for nighttime. Good night, everybody. It's very interesting to see all the information that comes out. I've had a couple of times very interesting situations where the kids sleep with one parent and the other parent sleeps somewhere else. And so right away you know that there's something going on in the family. Um, and so I'll just ask about that and come up with some interesting uh, uh, um, situations that children describe. So the dollhouse is relevant because it's the context of the child. Sometimes you want to have more than one dollhouse if the child's living, for example, in a foster home and there's a biological home. And then you can look at differences. Well, what's it like here when you're home? And what's it like in this home? And what are the rules? And how do you feel different? And where do you spend most of your time? And what activities do you do? Um, and the dollhouse doesn't have to be anything too fancy. Um, when I was uh, struggling and uh, didn't have a lot of money to spend on toy materials, I would take uh, shoe boxes and I would staple them together and make two and three story buildings sometimes and, and the kids would cut out windows. So sometimes it can be actually a creative process where you can make something together with the child and I think that that again supports the notion of mastery and self-esteem and things like that. In addition to art materials, sand trays, puppets and doll houses, there are an array of other toys and materials that may help children to express their emotions. I think it, with children who have been hurt, we also have to make sure there are props and tools that can give the child an opportunity for reparation. For example, uh, doctor kits are very important, hospital kits are very important. The other notion, oh, and, and any other caretaking things like um, dishes and plates so they can make food and feed 
the little dolls and create uh, dinner scenarios uh, where families can get together and feed each other or be fed by others. Um, all of this is real important. I also think of, with hurt kids, something that has to do with um, shielding and guarding themselves, protecting themselves. So I like to have capes and masks and things that kids can get behind, pillows, um, so that they can feel some kind of um, cushion of safety. Um, sometimes when I'm talking to kids and there's something they want to tell me but it's really difficult for them, uh, the telephones work very nicely because I can turn around with a phone and they can turn around. We're having contact, but it's with the cushion of safety that they need. So anything that has to do with privacy um, is important for kids who have been uh, abused or neglected. There's also um, one other additional thing that I have with kids who've been hurt who go to court, and that is a courtroom uh, uh, set. And that's something, not so much because we need to rehearse what they're going to say uh, exactly in terms of testimony, but because it's important for them to see what it looks like. And this is where you're going to sit, and the person uh, who hurt you, or allegedly who hurt you, is going to be over here, and there's going to be attorneys, and those are grown-ups, and you'll have one on your table, and there'll be one over here. And here's where jurors are going to sit, and just so that they can get a look at what that looks like. I've had kids come back after going to court where they come in and, and they set up the courtroom and then they do something they wish they could have done in the courtroom or they yell out something they wish they had said or they're very proud of what they said and they want to tell me verbatim what they've just uh, testified about in court. So that's another component that I've introduced into the uh, play therapy room with kids who've been abused that I think can be very useful to them. I cannot imagine a situation in which an abused child would not benefit from individual therapy. Their experience of victimization is painful, alarming, and confusing enough to warrant speedy intervention. The individual therapy may be short-term and may precipitate the need for family or group work. It's my belief that every abused child deserves a one-on-one -on -one experience with a trained professional as well as clinical attempts to ensure a safe environment for the child. Probably the most important opportunity that we have when we have children come to us is to provide them with an environment that is safe and that accepts them and that encourages them and that facilitates them. We have to make sure that we both communicate this in our posture and in our tone and by the content of what we say. But we also have to make sure that we communicate this by creating physically an environment that is user-friendly to children and that has the types of props and tools and games that are conducive to symbolic playing through so that children have ample opportunity to demonstrate their concerns, their preoccupations, their joys, um, the things they know about and feel good about as well as the things that they're confused by or that they just don't simply feel good about. And so to create opportunities for them I think is probably the most important gift that we have to offer. And it's our responsibility as well as our privilege.